It is just a huge honor to be sitting in my home on a Friday afternoon and have Daniel Butterman stop by for a podcast. You are a legend in my mind, and after this show, you're going to be a legend in many other people's mind. He's a general and cosmetic dentist with a practice emphasis on implant placement and restoration. In his capacity as an advanced CIRAC trainer, mentor, and visiting faculty for CIRAC doctors, Dr. Butterman has trained other dentists worldwide. In 1994, he graduated with honors from the University of Maryland Dental School, which was the first dental school in the world in 1856, which I think is interesting because G.B. Black's the father of modern dentistry, and he was born in 1836. He was, most people don't realize that before, um, like G.B. Black, everybody was learned by an apprentice. Yep. You learned dentistry because you worked with a dentist for Never met the guy when I was... When I was... <laughs> you never met him? And uh, Dr. Butterman... Um, was awarded the Mastership Certification by the International Dental Implant Association and the Fellowship Certification by the International Congress of Oral Implantology. He is also a member of the American Dental Association, the Colorado Dental Association, and the Metropolitan Denver, Denver Dental Society. So you teach CIRAC in the most elite CIRAC deal, which is CIRAC Doctors, with uh, Samir Puri, yes. who's uh, been on the show. And, um, and also you place implants. Yes. Yes. And uh, so, 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 which is, which which do you love more? Which do you like to teach more? Oh, I have to say, I, I, I started with implants years ago, and I kind of the the whole idea of the implant placement just kind of blew me away. Where we can take nothing and, and create a tooth from it, um, but things sort of evolved and things changed for me with the advent of Sarek and being able to incorporate all these pieces together. Just sort of. Which do I like better? I I like the combination of both. I like I like teaching both of them together because they they mix so well together. Well, right, right here in Phoenix Valley, we got two dental schools: one out in Mesa, AT Still, one out in Glendale, Midwestern. And every one of those graduates walks out of school and says, "Darn it, they I didn't learn how to place one implant." How do you? What would you tell a graduate? How do you go from zero to one? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think that there's a. Um, there's sort of a push for people to learn it quickly um, and I can tell you drilling a hole in bone and putting an implant in you can learn that in a weekend course but that's really not implant dentistry um, and I think that we need to be a little bit careful that we step back and maybe do a larger program something that can more teach the biology teach the uh, construction the the everything that's happening with the entire implant process so we really understand the treatment planning part um, because I can tell you from my perspective, when I place implants, the hardest part I ever do is not drilling the hole in the bone. It's doing the treatment planning and figuring things out beforehand, and that's where the education comes in. Yeah, and I mean, just little things like some people are worried about putting an implant in someone who's a smoker. I'd be ten times more worried about a Bruxer. Sure, sure. You know? The United States... A lot of the implant training is tied to the manufacturer. Yes. So a lot of a lot of these dental students, they almost feel like, well, I need to pick the implant first because, especially like in the Phoenix Valley, I mean, sure. almost all the courses are manufactured uh, courses. What do you say about that? Do you think you shouldn't learn to manufacture courses? Some people say, well, it's like driver's ed. You didn't end up buying the car that you used right. in driver's right. ed school. Are, um, is, is the system a big part of your implant journey, or is that a little part of it? Yeah, I would say that um, certainly taking a course from an implant manufacturer, it's great in that you get to play, you get to dabble a little bit, you get to see, is this for me, is that something I'm interested in or not? Um, but I think if you decide that, that I'm excited about this, this is great, then taking a course, because really, titanium is titanium to, for a certain degree. Um, and, and yes, there are nuances and differences between manufacturers, but the biggest part of the education is biology, healing, um, treatment planning, and those are, those are parts that aren't necessarily going to be covered and taught in a, in a manufacturer course. So I think they both have a place. And certainly taking a larger course, and there are many, and I, I did my training through Carl Mesh, who we recently lost. And, um, That's right in mind. And, and, and his, his whole premise was... It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what brand. And I think a lot of the courses that teach more on a generic approach, just principles, will let you be able to ask the right questions. Because Why don't we go get um, Carl's book? But the technology is constantly changing. And, and salespeople come into my office all the time with the latest Surface and the latest implant, latest and greatest. But if you haven't learned the basic principles and understand what you're really looking for in an implant, what works, what doesn't work, 
then it's uh, it's hard to make a decision. By the way, I just I just made a post on downtown this reoccurring thread. You know, it seems like the millennials are always whining about their student loan -ness. And then right now in Dentaltown, a big thread today is um, this guy just got accepted to dental school. He hasn't even started. It's This is uh, August, and he's getting ready to start in the fall. But he's realized that um, he's going to have to borrow so much money. He's going to graduate $500,000 in student loans. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't buy it because, number one, I didn't have a car in undergrad. I didn't have a car the first three years of dental school. I didn't have a, get a car till senior year. For us, spring break meant going back home with mom and dad and hanging out with dad, drinking uh, bush beer out of a can. You say a that week. like it's a bad thing. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> these guys hop on airplanes and fly to the Caribbean, and and yeah. and, and and that whole both those schools look like new car lots for Japan. <laughs> and um, and you know when I um, talk about implant training, you know they'll want to. Uh, when when I learned to Mish, I mean I bought his book. And read it twice like a novel before I ever took a lecture. Like here's the last read I did. Mishes avoiding complications or ontology. But see the millennials, they they don't want to buy. They don't want to sit down and read an 800 page textbook, which would give you all the answers to the universe. They always want to get in an airplane, fly to Beverly Hills, sure. uh, stay in some resort. But it seems like they find the most expensive way to do anything. And by the way, let me tell you something about those student loan debts. I've never met a dentist in my life whose divorce didn't cost at least five times more than the student loans. <laughs> so your little whiny three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, yeah, go, go write some chick a check for two million someday, uh, and then tell me how expensive I'm, your stupid. I'm happy to say I know work. nothing about that. Well, well, you better keep treating Irene because I'm looking at Irene <laughs> no, over there, and no she's, she's the, I see no a two ideas. million dollar bill sitting there. <laughs> yeah, <can> and <laughs> yeah, at least, at least she's already she already knows what the number will be. She's already her girlfriends of her. They got a calculator app where if they we can change start. the subject. That would be awesome. <laughs> so, so my my. my my deal is is on the implant training is you know um, old sparks like me and if you think I'm bad you ought to see the boy's grandfather he's uh, 90 so he grew up in the depression oh my god he he has he has millions of dollars in the bank account and he, he won't go to a steakhouse yeah so it seems like though that generation my god they could squeeze 25 cents after or out of a radish yeah you know and then our generation loosen up a little bit. But the millennials are loose as a goose. I mean, you know, they just spend money hand over fist. Then they start having babies in dental school. Yeah. Some of these guys graduate in dental school, they've already got two kids, and it's like, don't, don't. That's not student loan money. That's just, that's just living high on the hog. I mean, I, I graduated in '87, and I didn't make Eric till '89. You know, I already had my house sure. and the baby room sure. set up. So, so my my first deal, is, and and then on on endo. Um, Pathways of the Paul just come out with their 11th edition. Well, God, after you read that, if you still have a question on endo, you're Stevie Wonder and you didn't see any of the words, um, you know, so. Yeah, you know, and, and in fairness. But where, would, but where would you tell them to get trained? If you know, someone it, said, it, sure. I want to get trained from A to Z, I want to know what you know. Where right. would you send them? You right. can't send them to Mish, he's gone. Well, they still have the program going, and I think I think the curriculum is still good there, and there are many other comprehensive programs out there. I think Garg has a, a fantastic program that he's doing as well. Arun Garg? Mm -hmm. um, and and. But the, in, in, in basically, in defense of the millennials, which I'm not, obviously. <laughs> what year? Thanks well, for laughing at that. Millennials, 1980 that. after. What year yeah, were you born? Yeah, I was I was born a little before that. I was born in 68. 68? Yes. Damn, you're looking good, man. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate Irene it. must not must be feeding you well and not stressing <laughs> you out. He runs a lot. He runs a I lot. I do run yeah. a lot. But uh, but but really, what they've done is they've embraced technology, and and I think that. People, guys my age and guys that have been doing the things that we're doing, implant dentistry, for example, for a long time, it's, that doesn't come so easy for us. And I think that spending money, if you're going to embrace technology, you got to do that. This stuff is ridiculously expensive. It all costs a lot of money. Um, they're maybe a little bit less likely with the sticker shock that, that a guy my age would be. And I think the uh, embracing that technology lets them change workflows. And that's what I've learned. The biggest, when you ask me which do I like to teach, that combination of the two where we're, we're placing implants, but we're using the technology piece of it just to streamline things. And we've changed our workflows entirely with, uh, with implant planning and implant placement, and especially with implant restoration now. We've, we've, taken, we've taken implant restoration down to one or two appointments now. Um, and I think millennials can embrace that. I think they can, 
they can sort of grab onto that. Because so, so what technology are you talking about? You, you're talking about the uh, CBCT. Absolutely. For, Absolutely. for implant placement. I, I, I think, I think. And w which CBCT did you go with? So I have a, I have an XG3D, a, a Galileo system. So uh, that that's the dense splice Serona. That's correct. And it's the Galileo's what? It's the XG3D. XG. 3D. Yes. And what's the X? I know what 3D is. What's the XG? So I have I no still, idea. Court, I, I still don't know what P90X stands for either. I, uh, uh, do you that know I know. That I do know. <laughs> well, what is it? The, the, what is P90X? No, I, know, I, well, I know the, the 90s I know the, I know program. The, I, I know the car. <laughs> The car, no, P, no, no uh, the the workout program. Oh, P, oh P90X. P90X. Oh, I, you know, my, my yeah, mind I know the that. ninety is the the day. I mean, it's a ninety. It's an anyway. Uh, I I've done a lot of it, but I I have no idea what it stands for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you like Den Splice Serona's Galileo's XG three D. Yes. And why did you like that one as opposed to Carestream or sure, Itero sure. or all the others? You know, for me, they all, they all take great images. Um, the, the, if we're looking, especially if we're looking at bone and we're looking at implant position, what I want to be able to do is a workflow. I want something that's going to be streamlined, something that I can go from A to Z with it. And again, it's a little different for me because I'm placing my implants and planning them, and I'm doing it in front of my patients now. So when I have a patient that walks into the treatment room and they're missing a tooth, and I say to them, have you ever thought about putting a tooth there? And they say, well, I don't know. Well, what can I do there? My answer is, I don't know either. Let's take a look. Let's see. Nice. So my workflow is we'll do a CBC of the area. Yeah, and and we'll say, well, let, let's take a look at the bone, and then while that's processing, I'll take my Seric and I'll do a scan of the edentulous space, and I'll design the crown, and we'll sit down and we'll say, well, that's what your crown's going to look like when we're finished. What do you think of that? And it might be a crown that's really low because the upper tooth is super erupted into position, and we get to have a conversation. We get to say, well, look how look how short that is. Is that okay for you? Or maybe should we think about doing some ortho on the opposing tooth? Or maybe we should crown the opposing tooth? What would you like to do there? And then when we see if the crown looks great, then we can pull up our scan. We can combine our design of our crown into our cone beam scan. And we can say, well, we should probably line up that implant so it comes right through the center of your crown. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Be and, and you're not in a mega rich area. I mean, we're we're Centen Centennial, Colorado. Uh, Centennial is a relatively affluent area. Um, but where is uh, it? A it's suburb southeast of Denver, and like uh, a standalone city or a suburb? No, it's a suburb. Suburb. It's so a, is it good money there? Yeah, it's pretty decent. Money and what there. percent of your patients are stoned? I, we've heard. <laughs> I've heard about your mar medical marijuana is now legal. It's not even medical I, marijuana. I, I, just... I can say that the decision making process has become easier in my <laughs> office. I don't know why, but all of a sudden it has. Uh, <laughs> and all of my patients are far more relaxed. So so it's uh, it all works out in the end for me. So has, how long has it been legal there? How long has it been legal? A couple of years now. Um, and has the state gone to hell in a handbasket, or has it been uneventful? I, I can honestly tell you that people that live there, from my perspective, other than the fact that there may be more dispensaries than Starbucks in certain towns, it's not something that we notice day to day. It really isn't. So it's been uneventful. I, I mean, it, it's totally, totally uh, under the radar uh, yeah. when you're living there. Yeah. Um, so, so you, so you, do you mostly like the Galileos because? It is integrated with your CAD yeah, CAM it, machine, it, it or, for, or for, I mean, you said you said in it, they all give a great image. They all give a great. So image. then, why did you pick Galileos? Again, because I want to be able to design my crown. For me, it's important to the be integration. Able to, well, it's important for me to design my restoration first. Um, it's important for me to see what the final crown is going to be able to look like. Not not just a simulation of a tooth, but the actual crown, the opposing inclusion, the contacts, everything about it and then be able to take that seamlessly and throw it into my cone beam software and then be able to plan my implant position based on where that crown is. And I don't know that there is as easy and seamless workflow with any of the other systems right now. Yeah, though, you know, the, the big debate is always the open system versus sure. the closed system. And the open system, the advantage is you can mix all the, the, the scanners and millers and mix all the pieces and parts. Sure, sure. And I, but and the it, downside to that is you better be tech savvy. Your office better be tech savvy because you go into so many offices and a patient will just throw a curveball and say, um, "Can you? Can you? Can I have a copy of that of that um, that X-ray or that CBCT?" And the, the staff doesn't even even know how to do it, or sure. they're like, "Do I get a, a burn it onto a disc or a or well, a they, this or that?" Yeah, that's and part of it. And the other problem is, what happens when things don't turn out the way you want it? What happens? I, I have a three D printer, for example, and and. 
those are great, and I think there's just a ton of cool things that we can do with them. But the, the software is still evolving, and you've got to run things through lots of different... If I want to print a surgical guide, I've got to run things through a couple different software platforms. Right. Uh, what if it doesn't turn out the way you want it? Which one of those pieces is the problem? And I think when you say an open system, that's fine until something happens. Right. So if you're a tech savvy and you don't ever need an IT guy and you can figure out all your firewalls and downloads, and if you're, if you're that guy... Then you could probably have an open system. Yeah, you know. But, but if you're not that guy, and you're always having to call up your your kids from college and say, "Hey, come help the old man figure yes. out this 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 printer or this or that or this or that," I, you know, it's just I, not going to get it done. I buy it for easier, faster, better. And if it's not going to be that way, I'm not interested. Um, I don't buy it for the sake of technology. I want it to make my life better. And if it complicates it, I'm not in that. That's that's not for me. Okay, now is this Galileo? Would you would you call it a large field, medium? No, field? my my particular. If I were to do it again, and again, things have changed. I've had mine for about four years now, and the technology has evolved from there. Things have changed from there. Mine's an eight by eight field of view, so so I I I, I can see third molar to third molar, basically. I can see about about halfway to two thirds up into the sinus. And would you uh, would an endodontist be able to use this? Oh, one? for sure, for sure. Yeah, you know what um, I'm. You know what's really uh, interesting about me is um, one of the pet peeves I have about implantologists is they um, they have a religious mindset of uh, you know they got a second you know the when you look at the one to thirty two teeth and you look at a hundred million insurance claims process you know, it's it's pretty much all flat. Then on the six year molars, it's these huge spikes. Mm -hmm. So it's like four huge spikes. So which tooth is most likely to get a filling? Six year molars. Which one is likely to be root canal? That one. Crown, six year molars. Extracted, six year molars. Replaced with an implant, six year molars. If a hundred crowns went to glide well, which is the most likely tooth to be crowned? Six year molars. So there's a prejudice against second molars. Well, I mean, the difference between, um, how, well, how old, you had three boys? Yep. How old it was your, your three boys? One is turning 21, 20, and a 16-year-old. Well, yeah, so just remember the difference how they took care of their teeth between 6 and 12. I mean, <laughs> at 6, True. you brush their teeth, and at 12, they brush. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's a humongous deal. And, and I wish Dennis would be far more aggressive on that 6-year molar when it pops through. I mean, I don't even like sealants. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, the pits and fissures, air abrasion, blow them all out or drill them all out. Seal that thing as soon as it erupts, because that tooth is going down the drain <laughs> As fast as you can, but but they'll um, but um, when they do these uh, sinus lifts, I mean there, there's a ton of um, rhinologists and ENTs in the valley that that you know some lady will come in and says, well I've had allergies for the last twenty years, and they find out it's a failing root canal for sure leaking into the sinus, and um, or an, an implant um, a sinus lift that's gone south, and they go up there with cameras and they show me these pictures of all this white fungus and candidiasis and, mm -hmm. and you see like the, the implant sticking into the sinus can it's just disaster and um and the rhinologists are like well you had a virgin second bicuspid and a, and a second molar why didn't you just do a damn bridge but the point is this the point is since dentists um, worship odontologist god and they don't you know the sinus will blow it up with a hand grenade stick <laughs> titanium cow bone dead cow bone yep. crap in there all this stuff like that but you need, it's standard of care that if someone comes in with a second bicuspid, first, second molar, and I say, well, how's your sinus? Are, do you ever have sinus problems? And someone says, well, yeah, I have sinus issues. I have allergies. You got to get a 3D x-ray yeah. of those uh, root canals that go around the sinus because a lot of them A lot of them are failing. Are failing and, I, and, I and do just I, leaking sludge into the sinus. I do a lot of endodontics in my office, and I can tell you that, that having a CBCT also before you do the root canal is unbelievable to know in advance is there that an mb2 canal and how far is it from the mb1 or to see that doesn't exist i mean knowing that before you come in but i can tell you that when my staff takes a cbct on, on a patient that i've done the root canal a couple years ago i get a little nervous because we don't we don't ever want to see our failures but it's amazing how many asymptomatic molars maxillary molars are sitting in the sinus just blown up well you know why i've never had a, a failure an endodontic failure is uh, what I do is I take the X-ray and I Photoshop it. And, <laughs> That's a great uh, idea. Yeah, That's I idea. mean I do some of the best work ever. On Photoshop. <laughs> I lectured um, in uh, Florida last year to a dental insurance association meeting, and there were like 300 dentists there that all worked for the dental insurance companies, 
And I was sitting there talking to them. You know, you saw them at lunch, hanging out with them. Um, and uh, I think it was in I think it was in Disney World for a couple of days. You wouldn't believe it. Though everyone would say the same thing. Guess how many? What percent of the PAs they get on a root canal of a max three first molar only have three got a perch points in them? Yeah, yeah. I would say the majority probably have only three. All of them. Yeah. And they're like, okay, I do this full time. I see a four. I see an MB two obturated yeah. about every time I see a blue moon. But that's a millennial thing. I don't think MB twos existed when I went to dental school. I think, <laughs> they, they, I think yeah. they're a new. They're a new invention. There. Yeah, I think but the only. Right. And then what's funny is you ask any dentist, well, what percent of your endos fail? They go, you know, knock on wood, I've never had one fail. But the insurance data and talking to these guys, seeing their data, um, when when you're talking about millions and millions and millions of root canals done every year. Um, if a general dentist does a molar root canal in 60 months, 10% have been extracted. If an endodontist does it, it's 5%. So you're telling me you've never had a root canal fail, but the data is showing that 10% are extracted because there's a big difference between failing and extraction. I mean, sure. failing might, maybe it didn't heal up. Maybe it's still sure. symptomatic. Maybe it's still, no, we're talking about somebody pulled the tooth and billed the insurance company. Hmm. So that, that's a pretty significant mortality. And then, then when you figure on that there's 4,000 endodontists working 40 hours a week, and they say that two thirds of their business is retreats. Right. And then you figure all the dentists have never had a root endodontic failure. That's a lot of immigrants coming into America. <laughs> that's a good point. With a lot of failed endo done in Romania, you know? Yes, <laughs> yes, that's, that's that, that, uh... I love inconvenient facts. And what dentists hate is, you know, they, they hate facts. I mean, like, like they'll tell you their their composites last as long as amalgam. I mean, okay, well, the worst study I can find on amalgams they last fifteen years. The average study is that they're lasting about thirty eight years, and the normative study on posterior composites is six and a half years. Yeah. Well, you so know, how yeah. how does how does every dentist I meet say, well, they don't do it right. I do it right. I have to say, look at implants even, and I and I think. When I first started placing implants, the, the common wisdom was that that's going to be there forever. 90 whatever percent of every implant we place is going to be successful. 99.2. Right. 98.9. Right. <laughs> there's, there's this thing called periimplantitis now. I don't know if, I don't know if you've heard of it, but, uh, but our patients sure have because there's a lot of things going on with implants that are failing or, or just not successful in the first place. And I think uh, part of that has to do with planning. Part of that has to do with biology for sure, but it's not necessarily as successful as we were originally led to believe. And a lot of it is still blows my mind about how um, how much the mind is closed, like like below the belt. You know, if some patient came into your office every six months with chlamydia, you know, or every three months, right. you'd finally say, you know, are you sleeping with someone with <laughs> chlamydia? <laughs> and and when we look at implants in 60 months, 20% have periimplantitis. And you go in these doctor's offices and they, they've seen grandma every three months for 10 years yeah. and they've never seen grandpa. Yeah. It's like, do you not know that she goes home and kisses him goodnight and the routine average grandma kiss transmits 80 million microorganisms, fungi, parasites, and viruses. And these people have all these perio programs with mom and they've never seen dad. Then you finally see dad and he's got like a bombed out cavity. He's got gum disease. He's got like, it's like, it's like, you know, I mean, they, they, we haven't even got to point in dentistry where they realize periodontal disease is a communicable disease. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think a lot of that we see is, is monitored negligence from dentists where we're just kind of watching it. And, and I, and I hate that even in my office, I hate the supervised word neglect. <laughs> yes. We'll just yes. see every three months. And, and you'll always have gum disease, well, and we'll just see every three months until... Yeah. I, I had a guy in dental school, and, and every time we'd, we'd talk about a watch, he'd say, what are you going to watch it do? I mean, the, what does that mean exactly? If something's going wrong, it's going wrong. Oh, imagine, imagine going to a farmer in Kansas and say, well, you know, we just expect your barn, and there's a little hole with termites in there, but we're just going to watch it. Mm -hmm. We'll come back every six months and watch it. I mean, if you tell a farmer yeah. he's got one little termite hole in that barn, they will cut out a section of that wood sure. the size of this table, and the dentist will say, well, we'll just watch it. Yeah. No, well, but I, and I think part of that might be that there's sometimes not, not a, a, a 
proper process as far as knowing what to do. What do you, just because you, you've got an implant and after a year or two now you see 20% bone loss, I don't know that we've necessarily developed the proper workflow, the proper pro, pro, protocol for a lot of dentists to be able to jump in and say, well, here's what we need to do, A, B, and C. Well, it doesn't exist in 2017. Yeah. So yeah. as of this recording, there is not a, a standard protocol. And, for and I think there needs to be. I think everybody needs to be on the same page. Hey, when we see this, it's not okay for pus to be draining around an implant. That just uh, that's just not a good thing. Um, is that a Colorado thing? <laughs> <laughs> just saying. We sometimes I mean, see that. I don't know. I think that might be a Colorado maybe, thing. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. And, and then the other thing is, um, um, what's tough is you know on an implant, on a removable, on the fix, where if grandma can pop out that denture and go in there, she can clean it much better and everything, but the market doesn't want that. No. Psychologically, they want it fixed, and then are you gonna go in there like, um, like um, you know, how are they gonna clean underneath that? And then some of this stuff, like the dentist will say, you really need to think it through, like, um, like on, the, on the floss. Uh, I mean, on like a water pick, you know, they're not going to brush and underneath those deals. Good. We've pre-selected for generally, not always, but we've generally pre-selected for patients that have demonstrated they have poor hygiene. Most of them, that's why they lost their teeth. That's why they're in this situation. Yeah, these aren't these aren't vegan uh, yoga instructors <laughs> that lose all their teeth, right? Well, that's normally the case, and I think, um, but I but I think you're right. The day of the the high water bridges where where it was super cleansable, our patients would shoot us if we ever did something like that for them today. That's how we used to do it, but not today. Now and, it needs to be form fitting. They don't want to. They don't want to see anything that uh, doesn't look like their natural tissue. Yeah, and then you you set them up and you say, well, you need to irrigate this out of the water pick, but then it makes a mess in the kitchen so, or the bathroom, yeah. so they put it below the sink, and that's why a lot of these companies are now going to my my, my favorite is still the shower floss. I mean, you know, you you get that in their patient's hand, they unscrew the shower deal, and they hook up the shower floss, and so it's just hanging there. Because when you're in the shower, you mm -hmm. don't care if you're blowing lettuce and sure. bacon and tomato all over the walls because sure. you're in the shower. But if their husband or, or the, the, the husband, if grandpa uses that at the bathroom and makes a mess, grandma will throw the damn thing in <laughs> the trash He'll in. do that once and that'll be it. Yeah. And, and, and water pick um, just now came out with a, a water pick where um, it's rechargeable. Mm. You fill it with water, then you can take it into the shower. Mm -hmm. And so it's these little things about, you know, is this getting done? Is this getting cleaned? And, right. and, 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 and it'd be really nice if, if you weren't making out every night with somebody with nine millimeter pockets. That, you know, that would be nice too. Uh, Trina, I, I tell all my parental um, people, I tell, first of all, that where I freak out is when the little girl's pregnant. I say, look, this kid will not be born with herpes simplex one, canker sores, streptococcus mutans to get decay, PG and valves. She won't have any of these diseases. Mm -hmm. And then the herd is going to infect her the minute she slides out. You, I mean, you'll take your baby and you'll hand it to your grandpa who's got upper and lower partials, hasn't had a dental cleaning in five years, and he'll kiss it right on the mouth. And you need to start, I want to see every single person that's going to babysit or kiss or whatever, and you need to start coaching them that you don't kiss apes on the mouth. You can kiss her hand, you know, you, you get, but I, it, it I don't is know amazing. that grandpa's going to appreciate being called an ape, though. Just saying. He is a monkey without a tail. <laughs> is that better? That's fine. Is that better? <laughs> but, um, but when you start, when you, um, you know, the, the people in the lead on this are the only, the only place I've seen it in the lead is uh, in Austria and Liechtenstein, where they're, where you'll go to dentists and say, well, what kind of practice do you have? And they'll say, well, you know, you know Germans. I have 1,812 patients. And 600 of them are under 21, and but they're they're culturing for streptococcus mutans. They'll say, you know, I'm very proud. I, I still have 400 of my 600 children under 18 still do not test positive. Interesting. To streptococcus mutans. Interesting. And America, I mean, they, the no prevent. Like, look at ortho. Talk to any anthropologist. There was no malocclusion from 200 years ago to one and a half million years ago, and now every kid has got a malocclusion. Why? Because for the last Two million years, where 100 billion humans have come and gone, they nursed for several years, and you fed them, you know, a, a woolly mammoth bone, and they're chewing cartilage off a, a dead animal. Mm -hmm. And now, when you nurse, the first time the child has any difficulty of this, you know, force spreading his palate, you switch him to a bottle and a sippy cup, and then start feeding him applesauce out of a jar. The kid has never had any force 
nothing spreading his palate or his jaws. And then they got these high arches and they got all these malocclusions. And the dentists aren't even the ones talking about it. The ones who's talking about all the research papers are anthropologists. They're mm. the ones publishing all these papers say, why is this? And it's like, why are the anthropologists figuring this out? Shouldn't the 10,000 orthodontists yeah, be having classes saying, hey, are you pregnant? Come over to my orthodontic office on the first Thursday of every month when we want all the pregnant ladies in our zip code. Let me show you how your daughter is not going to need, how your baby's not going to need ortho. And just because it's squirming while it's nursing, it, it you know, it, it, it should have to, you know, for a million years, they had a lot of effort to eat. Now you're feeding it, gosh darn, you know, applesauce and squash and all this crap out of a jar. They've never chewed. They've never... Um, you know, it's just amazing. But, uh, yeah, so prevention um, of these uh, periimplantitis, it's so much. It's it's the, it's the who they're sharing tablespoons with, who they're living with. They're sharing toothbrushes with them. They're kissing each other. And, and we're not treating the herd. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're treating, you know, here's Mrs. Jones. Well, Mrs. Jones is a herd animal, and she lives in a house with three other people. I need to treat this house. You know, it's like a farmer in, in Kansas. If you got... 50 head of cattle, you can't treat one. And if one of your head of cattle gets some infection, you know it could pass through the whole herd. You know, I, and I feel your passion about this, and I, and I don't disagree with you, but I think getting that message out there is a long time away. Uh, I, I, I just think that the social acceptance of that is going to be a tough sell. Yeah. Well, it, it took AIDS for the planet to get religion on STDs. Mm -hmm. Before AIDS, it was like, well, it's just going to be a baby or you might need a shot. And then after AIDS, the whole planet's like, whoa, you know, this is, this is a very, STDs are very serious. And, and I think what's going to be the AIDS for uh, communicable diseases is this HPV and oral cancer. Hmm. I mean, these kids are all going to college and think that if they wear a condom or, or they're, they're all good. And they're realizing, no, you put a condom on downstairs and then stick your tongue in some person's mouth. Right. And now you got HPV. Well, well unfortunately, I think, I think, uh, the vaccinations for HPV is getting more commonplace now, and I think uh, I think that's really being pushed by pediatricians to. Um, uh, to well, much Australia everybody. made it mandatory for all their kids, and Australians are brutal, man. Not only is that a mandated vaccine, if you go to school and your kids aren't vaccinated and you don't want to get vaccinated, they ask mm -hmm. you to leave the country. Huh. They're like, get vaccinated, or where do you want to be deported to? Yeah. And in Texas tried to mandate the HPV vaccine. Remember the backlash yeah, that? Yeah. Oh my God, they went crazy. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I think America's, uh, uh, I, I, yeah, it'd be nice if they got the HPV vaccine. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, it's certainly in my area. I know what personally with our kids that was pushed pretty heavily to us, and I, and I think that's a good thing. Oh, yeah, it's a very good thing. These, um, you know, this is 19, this is 2017, and a lot of people think the sky is falling, but go back just one century. So by 1917, you already had a world war going and the Spanish influenza that dropped 5% of the entire planet died during the flu season. Mm. And today you're worried about, you know, Putin hacking the elections and I mean, and, and you got all these people against vaccines. It's like this century is a gift compared to mm. the first 17 years of the last century. So what implant system did you end up going with? I've tried many of them. I've gone down a lot of uh, different pathways, and I, and I can say that I've had success with a lot of different pathways. Ones. Was one of the pathways. <laughs> that's, maybe maybe pathways. that's where the word came. from. You went from. down pathways <laughs> to the pulp. <laughs> that's, that, that may be where the word where the, where the word came from. But uh, but again, it, it it falls down. When I'm looking for an implant, I'm looking for specific things. I'm looking for, and, I, and I'll answer your question. But really, it comes down to. What is the shape of the implant going to be? What's the connection of the implant? Because these are all important things. And then is it going to integrate with the way that I want to restore it and the way that I want to plan it? And now I'm primarily focused on Astra. I, I like that system. I Astra. Like the, I like the Astra. That's the UV dense fly Serona system? I, it is. It is. And I just think that the workflow works nicely with the way that I do it. Um, but there are many systems. There are many that, that uh, work and out where, beautifully. And where is Astra headquartered? Where are they headquartered? I mean, I'm sure Dentsply uh, just bought it. Yeah, I, I wonder I, where it started. Do you, that I can, that I can. Do you don't remember the founding father of that, or I, I don't, I don't huh. know. If you do, email me. Tom. I will I'll definitely do that. I'm curious because usually behind any implant system, there's a dentist somewhere that designed it, started. <laughs> yeah. But that is one of the top three systems. I mean, 
Sweden has Noble BioCare, Switzerland has um, Strawman, and the Americans have Astra. And uh, it's just called Astra? Astra, and the, the, their newest connection that they've used is the EV connection. And what does the EV stand for? I have no idea, just like I have no idea where the company was <laughs> founded. You don't even know what P90X stands for. Yeah. You're in rock power. And How about Power 90? Power 90 is what it is? Yeah, P. P for power. P Wouldn't for power? Let's go with that. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll if, take If it. Tony Horton calls into your show <laughs> and tells you that it's different, that's fine. But otherwise, I'm sticking with it. Oh, him. my gosh. Uh, I have a whole P90X gym in my garage. It's so... Uh, I've fun. done them, too. I love the program. Yeah. Um, so so you like the, the EV Connect? The, the connection that is uh, that particular connection between the two. Because uh, that's important, and I think that... Um, so you're you're in a suburb of, of Denver. Yes. Here's, tell me if this is true or not. It seems like, okay, so I have a firm belief that um, if you're not doing the procedure once a week, you're never doing it good and fast enough For to sure. be good and profitable. Every time some dentist you find out he does like an Invisalign case every other month, or a snore guard every other month, or a sleep apnea, or an implant every month. They never reach critical mass. Sure, and then sure. you take the cost of all their continued education, their systems, and all that stuff, and it just would have been smarter to refer it out. Yeah. So if you gotta do it once a week, but the other pattern, you gotta do it once a week, but the other pattern I see is they always have a human, the ones who get it done, and they reach critical mass, and they place an implant every week, they always have a human rep in their field, in their city, that comes by it just seems like if there's not a human sure that I, knocks I, on your door you I never think, get it done uh, you know, true I, or false I, I think i think that it's it's partly for sure that's an important part having a relationship with a company that's going to be there to back you up that's going to be able to help you that might walk you through some complicated cases or even just to grab a part for you that you forgot to order is is very convenient i think are they nice are they have. are they fixing you up with other well, dentists that place well, implants well, maybe, or maybe, the maybe to card? maybe Maybe to a certain degree, but I, but I think that the, the, the whole process and the whole, uh, it more comes down to belief. Yes, yes, the rep is important, absolutely is important, but it's what do you believe in? Do you honestly believe that the best treatment you're doing for your patient is placing an implant there? And if the answer is yes, then the question is, how many bridges do you do? How many partial dentures? How many full dentures do you do? How many endodontic teeth are failing? So when people say to me, well, they just don't walk into my office, well, not a lot of people are necessarily going to walk in that it, have a pristine site for an implant that has been missing this tooth forever and, and knock on your door and say, hey, would you please put an implant in for me? But you've got this entire range of other patients that if in your belief system, that patient that's been wearing a partial denture for a lot of years and is getting a lot of bone loss, maybe that's somebody you should have a conversation with about implants. That, that full denture patient that came in for a reline, maybe that's somebody you should have a conversation with. And maybe before you grind the adjacent teeth down for a bridge, you might want to have a conversation about placing an implant. So those cases are in your I know you said grind down those teeth. You yes. didn't say grind out that sinus. Well. Are you, are you from the church of odontology? I, I, are I you from very, the church I'm of very ENT? careful. I'm very <laughs> careful. I mean, and no, but I, I, I respect the sinuses and I'm careful around it. Because that's why the all one four got popular. Of course, because Why? you were angling away from the sinus because you, uh, you wouldn't go into it. But um, um, and, and the thing that I like and the trend that I've seen that I do like are the shorter implants. I think that the the ability... The if, shorter, fatter implants. The shorter, fatter implants. And I'm short, sure fat, and <laughs> I'm strong <laughs> well, promoter. So, you're, so, you're, so you bought, you bought all that. No, and I, and I, I see that. a tall, skinny implant, it, I it think. It freaks that, you out. That, it's not natural. Sucks. No, I, It's I, not natural. It's not natural. But, but if we can use if we can use different systems to be able to avoid going in, into these structures, why not? How, how fat would I have to get to have an implant named after me? <laughs> I think you're all there. I, I think, think you got it. I think, I think there should be a Howard implant. It'd I think be the I, shortest, fattest one. I think we're going straight straight to P90X after this. I want you to call Astra and say, Let's make one so short and fat that we'll call it the Howard implant. <laughs> <laughs> so um um I really I really love the um I really love what I love the most about the Galio system and the the CAD CAM is that it's seamlessly integrated. You can go into offices and it just seems like again they get it done. Um you know, if you have a rep that comes in, they're more likely to get it done. If the system is all integrated from the manufacturer, 
it seems like it's a lot less training for the staff sure. to, to teach, to coach, to just get it done. Well, and, and once you get the workflow and once you understand it, my crown appointment is the same now in a single visit as what it used to be when I was doing multiple visits. And it just comes down to understanding the technology and having the pieces and the parts talk together, having the workflow be easy to... And now I want to ask you a controversial question. This is yeah. dentistry uncensored. We talk... Yeah. We, we and, and, I'll, and I'll lie to you if I feel like it's uh, the right response to go with. So go okay, ahead. but this uh, this uh, measures uh, the tone of your voice. This can tell us if you're lying. No, no, no. Say, I, uh, I got yeah. it from Russia. Putin Perfect. sent it to me. And well, and, I've uh, got a better system. My <laughs> wife is sitting right across here, so she'll, she'll like clue she'll you. She'll be over here going, yeah. Yeah. bullshit, uh, bullshit. Uh, um, okay, so this is a obvious source of confusion for um, kids in dental school and else. It seems like all the old guys like me. Any, any, all the guys from 50 to 70 who have placed a thousand implants or more, none of them use surgical guides. Mm -hmm. I would go to say that anyone who's placed 10,000 implants has never put, used a surgical guide. Except for like, uh, you know you know what I mean, yeah, the, the, the majority. Ahead. Okay. Standard deviation two. Okay. Um, far more than standard deviation one, 68.5%. We're, yes. we're talking standard deviation two. All the millennials, they swear by surgical guides. So how can you have these two polar opposite groups never use a surgical guide, always use a surgical that's guide? A, that's, that's easy. I don't even have to lie to you for this one. <laughs> so, so the guys that place 10,000 implants, generally, these are the surgeons. These are the ones that are typically Oral not restoring them. Oral surgeons. So, so I've got a great picture. I've got a beautiful implant in position number nine. Just dead Please center in the bone. Me. Was dead center in the bone. Tissues pristine around it. Gingiva is pristine around it. Happens to be sticking right through the patient's lip if you were to angle a crown through it. But there's great bone around it. So what's the goal of the surgeon? The well, goal first of all, I mean, is the patient in Tennessee? <laughs> this could be. Well, she could be the hottest. Yeah, chick you're in the right. You're part. right. But 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 the point is, if <laughs> if my goal is looking at it from a from a getting an implant in the right position in bone and treatment planning based on the bone, that's a totally different approach as my patients, and, and Carl Mish used to say this all the time, our patients don't want implants, they want teeth. So if I start with a tooth first and I say, I really don't want to have a, a cement retained restoration. I don't want to mess with cement. I want it to be a screw retained crown. If I start with that end in mind, and then I say, okay, well, if I want a screw retained crown, Sure, it would be nice if I could have that screw access right through the central fossa. That'd be, that'd be a great thing. So starting with those two pieces, and we say, well, it'd also be really nice if we can have that go right along the long axis of the implant. If you don't have those pieces in mind first, then your result's not predictable. So if we do that, though, and, and if we say that we're going to go a screw retained crown, and you have a surgeon that places his implant 5 or 10 degrees off, and now that's changed. Things have changed. And maybe you're still going to have a great restoration that's going to work really well, but the lab might call you and say, yeah, it's coming through the marginal ridge, are you okay with that? Or it's coming through the buccal cusp, are you okay? So it just becomes less predictable. And I, and I would say that I have placed many implants non-guided. The, the reason that I've leaned more towards doing guided is because it lets it, it makes it easier for me when I go to restore the tooth, it's more predictable. And what percent of the general dentist do you think if they weren't placed implants, would prefer to send it to a periodontist instead of an oral surgeon because they think the placement would be better? I'm not going to answer that question. I think that's a loaded question. <laughs> and, <laughs> but what and I'm going to either piss off my, my periodontist or my oral surgeon. B because, because Jay Resnick is one of the greatest oral surgeons that ever lived, and he uses all um, guided implant placement because he always tells me, he says, Howard, he says, I, I'm a surgeon. I can eyeball this and get it right 99% of the time. But I do all guided 100% of the time because that 1%, if I'm off 1% one at 1%, he goes, that, that's, that's one out of every 100. That's a lot of restrictions. He's placing 100 a month. Right. So he doesn't want one referring dentist yes. in LA once a month to get this case you're talking about. Now, it, now, now to play and devil's it, advocate just a little bit, as much as I do believe in guided surgery, I think one of the trends that we're seeing that I don't love is that some dentists are only learning guided surgery. And they're not a surgeon. And, and, and Well, they're not a surgeon. And what happens when you go to place that implant and there was a mistake or something doesn't feel right or the bone isn't as dense as you thought and now your implant's spinning, you don't know what to do. You don't want to know what to do. And I don't want people to feel like if I learn to do guided surgery, I can close my eyes and drill through that hole and think about what I'm having for dinner. 
because it's not that easy. I think everybody should know how to place an implant freehand and know what it feels like and know what they're shooting for. And the guy's just a tool to get you a better, more accurate result when it comes to the restoration. So that's that's a good point. You need to be a surgeon. Yes. You need to learn how to lay a flap. You're not you're not just punching a punching a hole through a guide to get your implant in there. Yeah. Some of them go that way, but again, it's that one percent. So uh, if you were born in us, you said you were born in sixty what? Sixty eight. Sixty eight. So you're an old fart. You thanks. just look good. Uh, thanks. Um. So uh. Uh, he's on steroids and human growth hormone. His best friend is Lance that's why, Armstrong. That's why I'm so bulked out. He, huh? he's, a, he's hanging out with Lance Armstrong. But um, yeah, I can still remember the greatest thing on the uh, the radiology is when the Pano upgraded, a software upgraded, and they put the R on one side and the L on the yeah, other. Yeah. I thought that was the greatest invention. Uh, but uh, I just think about these people on the CBTs, and I think of how many millions of implants were placed with a 2D Pano. Sure. And, uh, but there were tricks. I mean, there were yeah. the, the guys that were good, the mesh that could could sound bone and, and well, kind of well, figure all that. Well, out. you had a two D pano, but you were flap. You were opening for the sure. flap for sure. So so now, if you're going to punch the gingiva, you have to have a three D CBCT. Yeah. But it's nice to be able to have the skills where you could use just a pano because you can flap and see what you're working sure. with. Sure. Sure. And uh, but the, but again, the the uh, the healing is a lot easier when you don't flap. It is. I think. I think for sure the the morbidity is less, and uh, um, but still, it's it's you need, a necessary. You need to. Evil. You need to. You need, you need to know. You need to be able to. Do you need both. to be be able to do both. Is yeah. what you're saying. You should yeah. be able to place an implant with a pano and a PA, and you should be able to place an implant with a right. CBCT. But that's that's where the programs we were talking about come in because it's that whole education part. The education isn't for when when you take a weekend class, and again, nothing against those classes, but. When you do that and you learn how to drill a hole in bone and torque an implant and know what the parts and pieces are, that's great for when everything goes great. The education is that 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the time when something's off, something's not quite right. That's where the education comes in. So you you went out of your way to talk about cement uh, screwing versus cementing. So I don't want to talk about screwing. My my. It's wife dentistry uncensored. The, We're going to talk not, about. Not, let's I'm talk not talking about, screwing. about screwing. Okay. All right. All right. You got me. You got me. Let's do it. Um, do you think it's very important to be able to screw retain your crowns as opposed to cement? I'm afraid of cement still. I really am. Um, and, I, and I think cements are getting better to where they're more radiopaque and we can, we can see them better on our images. But my goal, I always shoot for screw retain. Now, I can't always get there. The situations are going to be there where, where we're going to have to be cement retained. But... You know, I, I just think if we can shoot for that, we're going to be less likely. There'll be one more thing, one less possibility that's going to cause a problem with our implant down the road. And when, when something goes south, it'd be a lot cheaper to unscrew it. For sure. Than to cut it off. For sure. And do uh, you, you have very good luck tapping out? I mean, no, I, know, I, I, I would never point do it now, that. Way. I, I never even try to tap off I, anything. You, you, you turn your cement retained crown into a screw retained crown. You do endo access on it, and then you unscrew it as one complex. Um, so it becomes a screw retaining crown that you should have possibly done in the first place. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, that's too much. Um, so are you so on your surgical guides? If you placed one hundred implant and your last one hundred implants placed, yeah, single units sometimes, and not because multiple units on sure. edentulous arch. I mean, you know that you what what percent of your edentulous patients multiple units on edentulous arch would you use the surgical guide on I, i'd say by far the majority by far the majority by far what percent of your first molars just the first molar where they had a second bicuspid and a second molar would you use would you use surgical guide part of the answer I, now it's close to 100 percent, and it's not because i i feel like i have to but the technology has made it so easy for me i'm going to plan my implant in comb beam anyway I'm going to design my restoration anyway. So it's just one more step to design the surgical guide in my software, and I hit mill. Why not? And, and is, Why it, not? is it milled out, or is it... Or is it I, uh, I do both. I do, do both. Do you do, um, do you do 3D printing, or I'll, do you do I will milling? either... I will do one or the other. I'll do one or the other. If I need it quicker, 3D printing... There are some printers that can do it relatively quickly, but the, uh, the one that I have, the Form 2... Takes about the uh, form two. Yes, it's made by Form Labs. Form Labs, Ryan, can you send me that? Why did you it's, pick Form two? I mean, I've never even heard of that. So what? I'm oh, you you will hear it of it. I promise you. Um, 
a couple main reasons for it. It's incredibly accurate. There are a lot of dental specific resins that you can use for it. So you can choose a resin that can be autoclaved that you can make a surgical guide with. Yeah, I, right. I can tell you one of their competitors, um, Sprint Ray, which makes probably the, the, the next up and coming printer, Moon Ray, they're based out of California. Um, great company. I think the CEO Sprint of that company, Ray. I think the CEO is like 26 years old, just an incredibly brilliant guy. Um, and they, uh, they're they making a slightly different version of a printer, but same idea. And what, what percent of that business is for dental? Uh, it's become incredibly popular with dental. I think, I know Sprint you, Ray in particular has shifted most of their business. Did you find Sprint Ray, Ryan? Out of California? Sorry, what's that? Did you find Sprint Ray? Sprint Ray? CBCT out uh, of California? No, they're, they're a, a printer. They're a, the, a 3D Three, printer. 3D printer. And their printer is called the Moon Ray. The Moon Ray. So they have a Moon Ray D now, which D is for dental. Uh, Moon Ray D. Nice. Uh, and they, they're, they're jumping in on that market because there are so many things. What if you could print your night guards? What if you could print your surgical guides? What if you could print clear liner retainers for patients? What if you could print permanent restorations? So that's the direction we'll see. I think milling now is still much more efficient. We have a vast you got to think bigger, though, because I've, I've been thinking about printing $20 bills. <laughs> Um, I haven't found the resin for that yet. You haven't found a resin, haven't for, found that? A resin for that yet. That's no. all I want to print is three dollar bills. <laughs> and uh, so, um, but do you think um, go out in the future? I mean, I, in, nobody predicts the future. I mean, I, I tell these people that you know um, when you're 54, no one predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. No one predicted the Arab uprising. No one predicted um, 9/11. You know, so, so it seems like, and then after the event, everybody, everybody knew it was going to happen. Right. But no one knew an hour before. But to me, you're pulling this three-rooted tooth, and then you're going back and you're drilling a singular hole for your implant. For sure. And then you look at 3D printing. I mean, do you think we're around the corner from, I'll extract the tooth, I'll scan the tooth, it'll print out a replacement tooth and titanium or bioceramic, and I'll just replace. Remember that movie, Little, the $6 million man? Yeah. yeah. Well, we have the money. We have yes. the technology. We have the know-how. Do, do you think you, we'll you be... You invent it, and I promise I'll buy it. Do, do you think we'll be doing bioidentical? Why not? Because then you wouldn't have to even drill a hole. Why not have biocompatible materials that you could print out and design? And, and like you said, I mean, the, it, it's so easy now to be able to get an accurate 3D scan of something, whether it's with a CBCT or some of the digital imaging systems out there and then incorporate that into a printer. Why not? Because, so you agree it makes sense that of it- Of course it does. If I extract, because when you look at, um, you know, I always think about uh, when people say, what is the average American? Can you imagine if a UFO just swooped down Earth and took one person back to whatever planet they're from and said, this, this is a human. I mean, what if it was a little five foot two Irish girl with red hair? What if it was a six foot eight Cardinals football player that weighed 280 sure. pounds? And to me, it, when I look at these implant selections, I just think the ultimate implant selection would just be to scan your extracted tooth. Hell, the, the CBCT could ex just um, um, scan the, the empty socket after the extraction. Because if, you know, and then you just mill yeah. a now, bioidentical now, now if, you, if you can also print out the PDL, then you'd be in business. <laughs> then you'd be, that'd be. Um, I wanted to ask you about that. You know, there's so much is cosmetics. Um, you know, I've always said that in dentistry, especially for women, Oral health is done for mental health. I mean, if you pulled Irene's, and like I'd have to ask Irene, Irene, how much money would I have to pay you to extract your front Carol tooth? Implant no, she's hand. kidding. <laughs> she's kidding. <laughs> but really, how much money would I have to pay you to pull your front tooth? If he were placing the implant? No, no, no. You just oh. had to pull the front tooth and go without your front tooth the rest of your life. Oh, well, I wouldn't buy that. Would you do it for a million dollars? No. So, so, so when people will not pull their front tooth for a million dollars. I mean, if I was married, I'd make my wife pull her front tooth for a million dollars. I'd say, honey, get over there and pull that tooth. You pull the damn tooth. I'd, I'd pull it myself for a million dollars. But the bottom line is, you know, the um, dental health, oral health, is done for their mental health. And so a lot of people, uh, you know, the, the co I, I still think the hardest implant case in the world is um, a single incisor 100 percent agree and the last one i did <laughs> after you know played with this thing forever i sent her to my buddy a prosthodontist 
and had him redo the whole damn thing and gladly wrote a check. I mean, because her expectation, you know, it was, it was front tooth, high right. lip line. Right. And, um, and so, so some people are talking about that they, they, they should be maybe be ceramic, so you don't have that dark metal. Do you, do you think, do you think Astra, do you think um, Densefly, Serona, Astra, do you, do you see them coming out with a um, porcelain glass implant around the future? I, I, I can, or, or I can you tell you that, so? that, that that is actually becoming fairly popular in Europe. I know Strauman has a, uh, a full ceramic implant. Um, I'm not in really in favor of that. And it was funny because you, it brings up a lecture with Carl Misch years and years ago because that's not new. That's not new. They used to have and they tried ceramic implants many, many years ago. And the problem is the, the modulus of elasticity was so stiff, so rigid with it, that they were seeing lots of failures. Now, it, it sounds great in principle to have something that's white and not gray to show through, but uh, I don't know. I, I, well, I'm concerned well, Carl, about that. Carl um, even said that uh, when one of those fractures needs to be removed, what are you going to do? Right? Removing one was a right. crazy. Right. What, what are you going to do? And then what are you going to do if the implant is slightly off angled? Having parts and pieces that join together, I don't love that idea. So I think right now most of the, the workflow has been on one piece ceramic implants. But are you going to prep that? Are you going to cause micro fractures in that? What do you, what do you think Carl will be most remembered for? I, I think he was the most, uh, as far as his teaching skill, being able to call bullshit when it was bullshit, being able to, to sit there and say, here's my belief and I don't really care what you believe and, and here's the research to back it up. Um, that part of the education has changed now. And I think we see a lot of people talking about things. Maybe there are different incentives that they have and there are different reasons for saying what they say, but he was a no-bullshit kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and who was the prosthodontist that used to lecture with him? And he finished out in gr Green Laboratories in Arkansas. Do you remember that guy who's a yeah. prosthodontist? I don't know that it, he, he wasn't part of the, uh, when I did it years and years ago, I don't know that he was part who of Who was, that. but do you remember the prosthodontist yeah. that used to work at Green Laboratories? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Uh, prosthodontist, uh, Green Laboratories. Who was, I wonder if his name will come up. Um... Gosh, I can't believe he died of cancer um, five or ten years ago. But I'll tell you what my favorite instructors are. You know, so many of the lecture circuit, you know, they, they did, you know, 500 cases. And they show you, they just come show you the best of the best of the best. And they just sit there. And basically, it's just a low self-esteem convention where he's trying to validate himself that he's mm -hmm. great or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I love the most about Carl is how he could put up six carousels of slides and go through every dental abortion mistake he'd yep. ever done. And even this book, I mean, I mean, think about this, it's so cool. Avoiding complications. And he's showing you every failure that he ever saw, found, or did. And who was that guy who, uh, the, the process? But anyway, I love the lectures are, you know, like, who cares about veneer? Show me the veneer case that failed. Right. How do you fix the failed one? Right. Um, don't show me how to do a root canal. Show me how to do a retreat. Why? Yeah. You know, I love the doctors that have so much self-esteem. They can get out there and say, let me show you every time I ever struck out in my life. Yeah. Whereas most of the lectures are, today's going to show you uh, every grand slam I hit since, since you know, preschool and little league. And here's me hitting That's a home a run point. in high I school. Mean, wouldn't it be cool to do a lecture and you say, I'm just going to take my next 10 cases. And those are going to be the cases that I'm going to show, good or bad. It's going to be those ten cases, and that's what we're going to talk about. That's, that's because a that's failure. Not easy, a failure is just if you learn something from a failure, it's just an expensive lesson. Yep. And it seems like in the last, you know, like these the millennials that get out of school. My God, the first three or four years out of school, you're the best dentist that ever lived because you haven't practiced long enough to see anything <laughs> fail. Nothing's come back through your door yet. Yeah. Yes, and then at five years out, you're like, well, maybe they should take away my license. Yeah, and I yeah. should no longer practice anymore. And uh, these, um, um, just, I've always learned the most from a failure. Mm -hmm. I remember I changed my hygiene pay from paying them 35% of um, production to um, an hourly wage because I didn't understand variance and I didn't realize that a dentist could have the whole morning fall apart. Mm -hmm. But then you could come in the afternoon and have a root canal build up and crown, two different root canal build up and crowns. So the variance in what I can do for hours is so huge. But when you're a hygienist and you lose 
two patients in the morning. How do you really make that up? Just to, for sure. And I didn't understand the variance, and it wasn't until I lost one of my favorite hygienists in the world, and she gave notice, and she took a job somewhere else, and she said, it's, it's because I, I'm not working on commission. Mm. And that's what made me, that the pain of that is what made me rethink the whole deal and realize she's actually right. Mm. But I had to lose, uh, I think her name was Donna Moore, if you're still out there <laughs> watching it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, her name was Donna Moore. But it was, so I've learned, it seems like the most dentistry I've ever learned was only from the failures. Yeah. Wow, it's my favorite saying, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. And I, and I think Experience is what you experience get? Experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. Nice. You can steal that, that's yours. Nice. I stole it from somebody else. Were, now, were you smoking that legal, <laughs> that legal marijuana when you thought of that? That, that has nothing to do with it. That doesn't enter. You know, they voted. They all. voted it down in Arizona. And uh, I'll tell you what. I, if you ever have a patient come in and see the uh, the the governor, the mayor, or whatever, if I was advising Colorado, you know what I'd tell them? When Vegas got legalized gambling, or I said the mafia got legalized yeah. gambling in Las Vegas, as they started making bank, they spent a good chunk of that money keeping gambling illegal in the other 49 states mm. and my gosh if you look at the amount of weed that colorado is selling and how it's had a ha impact on pricing of the sure. houses all that stuff it's because in the states it's not legal i mean think about this bet Here, here's the reality of the bet if i ask you leave phoenix drive three hours south of the border cross into mexico pick up some marijuana and drive back and i'll and i'll pay you a thousand dollars see you later You'd say, oh, sorry. You'd say that's high risk. I wouldn't do that. Ninety-nine percent of Americans would do that, of course. But if I said get in the car and drive to Denver, Colorado, well, I mean, I'm fifty-four years old. I've never once had a police officer say pop the trunk. I mean, if I get pulled over speeding, it's a, it's your license registration. Right. So it's a very low risk driving to call Denver and back. So the so. If call if I was Colorado, I would spend all your money fighting it in all the other states, mm -hmm. and uh, they just lost it in the election here. Um, but there were a couple states that passed. Yeah, I know, and you need election, to you need so. to you need to keep that. You need to step on that. Yeah, yeah, you don't <laughs> want that legal. Same, same thing with um, casinos. As these casinos rolled across the United States, it hurt Vegas so much. You know where they're putting all their money now at? Keeping um, gambling illegal off the internet. Now, if I can make implant placement illegal in every other state now that would be cool i'd be all in on that but vegas thinks their downfall is going to be when um, um everybody can just play the slots on their iphone mm. so they are fighting that tooth and nail mm. but uh so um gosh i can't believe we've gone an hour that we've already gone over an hour um what is, is there anything i miss that you're still passionate about um oh i know what i want to uh, talk about um what percent on a single unit account, what percent are you milling out? Are you are you sending any to the lab? Very, very rarely. Very, very rarely, rarely to the lab. There's, there's just not a reason for it. We've got so many different materials for really any indication that you would do. Um, there's just not a reason anymore to do that. And are you just, and, and what is your, for your standard bread and butter six year molar, yeah. what, what block are you using? It's going to be probably a, a lithium disilicate material or a, a lithium silicate. They're relatively similar. Lithium disilicate, which would be Emacs, or the relatively similar equivalent would be uh, would be Seltra Duo. So one of those and how do, how do you spell? That's a dense ply one. That's a dense ply. And one. what's it called? Seltra Duo. Spell it. C E L T R A D U O. C E L T R A R A. Second word D U O. D U O. As in two, as in two purposes. Duo means two in what? Is that, <laughs> what language is that? Just, Italian? Just, just go with it. Just go with it. Seltra duo and duo means two. Ryan, what language does duo mean two in? Uh, Latin. Is it Latin? <laughs> sure. Is it Latin? Let's okay, go with it. Um, what, what's the difference on the price of the block? What, what's an, an Emacs block from Ivoclair and a Seltra duo from Dense Place? Yeah, probably across? similar. Probably in the in the $30 range. $30? So, so no one's trying to get your business by having the... Uh, Cost leader, the IKEA, Walmart, Costco, well, Southwest Airlines. If you think, if you think about a hundred and fifty dollar lab bill versus a block, which is going to be in the upper twenties to low thirties, a couple bucks is it going to make a difference? Probably not. I, I'll choose it more for workflow and what I'm looking for in, in the in the result. But if you did a hundred first molars, what percent would be Emacs 
And what percent would be seltzer do? You know, it's changing. It's changing. And, I, and I, I'd say that it totally depends on the indication what I'm looking for and the result I'm looking for. Okay, what about, that's lithium disilicate. What about the, um, um, the zirconium? Yeah. I, I, when, I, when zirconia first came out for chair side restorations and chair side milling and single visit dentistry. In the CEREC machine. So it, when it first came out in the CEREC machine, I thought, what the heck do I need this for? I, I'm totally fine with the other materials I'm using. But I bought it. Just because I like buying toys, and I thought, why not? Oh, so it's a separate it? milling machine. Well, so so right now the current version. So people that were to buy Ceric technology today would have a milling machine that that would be able to dry mill it, and and that's important because you can in the older machines you could wet mill it, but the the sintering or the firing process of it takes longer, um, it takes an extra ten minutes, and you know, and for dentists, ten minutes is ten years. I mean, we just we just can't wait for anything. So when it first came out, I I invest in that technology without really appreciating what advantage it was going to bring to me. But it's been huge. It's been a big difference because the fit, the accuracy, when you take a material and you grind it and it starts out 25% larger, you have a limitation with the size of the burrs that can mill that restoration. But number one, the burrs are smaller for milling zirconia, and then it mills out 25% larger. So once that condenses and shrinks back down, the anatomy, the fit is unbelievable. But on your standard first molar, do you would you prefer a zirconia? If I came into you, yeah, and I broke my first molar, I, I have uh, seven uh, inlays on lace crowns. Yeah, uh, mine are all gold, right? Because when you're short, fat, and bald, you know you're, you're not going for looks. You're just going for a. Uh, I don't know. I just want it all gold with um. Sure. Um. um oh my gosh, what's this cement? Um, I can't believe it. My, my, zinc like, phosphate. Zinc phosphate. Yeah, I mean that's just to me that to me that's still the gold standard. Mm -hmm. um, would you, if I came in broken first molar, would you yeah. do zirconium or would you do lithium disilicate? So right now in my office, I probably wouldn't do zirconia because the uh, material for for being able to get it done quickly right now is fair. It's fairly opaque, and I'd say the cosmetics is higher. So if I don't need that sort of strength, and that always comes back to what's strong enough. Is, is 400 megapascals strong enough? Is 1,000? What do you need to get the job done? So I, if you look in Europe and you think, and you see how many people are doing zirconia crowns in Europe, it's not big there. It's not big there. It's not like here. We're all in because we want the strongest. We don't want our patients to ever knock on our door. We don't you know, want any you know, possibility. You know what the red flag out. I see on zirconia is, is? You just said it with, um, when you talk about the implants versus the porcelain. You know, you say porcelain is stronger than Tupperware because you can put porcelain on, on a runway and have an elephant stand on it. Yeah. But if I drop porcelain, it shatters. Right. And then you say Tupperware is weak because if I have an elephant stand on it, I'll smash it, but I can drop Tupperware in advance. Sure. And when that implant was titanium, the fracture rate was lower than when it was all porcelain. Right. Because with all porcelain, there's no give. And I am already seeing some red flags from endodontists on this show who think that since zirconium is so damn hard that you're going to fracture more roots because now the weakest thing on that root canal buildup and crown, it ain't the zirconian. Now it's, it's the root. Well, look at the implant too. Because if you think about it from before, when we used to place implants in and we'd, we'd screw in our abutment, the screw always got loose. That was the weak link. And implant companies didn't like that and we didn't like it. So now that's not a problem anymore. We really don't see screw loosening, screw fracture very often. So the weak link became, we had a PFM crown. We'd have our, our feldspathic porcelain that would delaminate from the metal and that would fracture. So that was, our patient would overload the implant, that fails. Now we've got an implant that's really strong. We've got a screw that's strong. We've got an abutment that's strong and now we're putting zirconia on top of it. We've sort of eliminated the weak link in that equation. So our patients are still going to overload our implants. What has now become the weak link? And my, my thinking is that it might be the bone. Are we going to start seeing more cupping around implants? Are we going to see patients overloading our implants? Because we really haven't built in anything that's going to have any give to it. Did you like that show? You are the weakest link. <laughs> Do you remember that one? That no, British? because it's normally me that's the weakest link. So it kind of hits a... Uh, Hey, what is the chance we could get some online CE from the master? Love it. Love really? It. You, you, you tell I me what you're looking for. We'll set it up. I love it, man. No, I'd, I'd love to do um, it. Huge fan of you. Huge fan of your work. Um, it is so... Uh, it doesn't surprise me that here you are. You fly into Phoenix. You're going to lecture tomorrow. 
you're with your wife, and what do you do before? I mean, it's Friday night, <laughs> and you decided to stop by my house I am and talk a huge to my fan. Homies. I'm a huge fan, and, it, and it's an honor for me to be here, and I truly appreciate you inviting me over to do this. So. Uh, buddy, the honor is all mine. No, thank you. Thank all you. right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck with it. Now, how old your boys again? You said they're... 16, 19, or 16, 20, and 21. So you're right in the crazy I'm, zone I'm, right yeah. now. This is, these are not good years for you. Oh, they're they're expensive years, but they're good years. Yeah, from 16 to 25 is a little crazy. Yeah, uh, they but, sure uh, they, don't, Just remember this. When they start turning 25, 26, they'll be normal. <laughs> they were, uh, all, I, I say all my boys were perfect till I gave them car keys, and then they were crazy till they turned 25. Oh, that's funny. But uh, all right, thanks so much hey, for coming Hey, thanks by. for having me. I really right, appreciate thank it. Thank you, buddy.